We're glad that you are here this morning, and uh, we're going to continue with our study on the Beatitudes. We are moving on. As you can see, the schedule okay. Hopefully that shows up where you can see that okay. Today, May 1st, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. That is what we're going to be talking about today. Next week, we're going to be talking about blessed are the pure in heart. We're skipping over the merciful because that was covered in the third class. But I appreciate those that have tuned in online. I heard several nice comments from people that were from Indiana and, and, and other places, uh, Tennessee. I appreciate the kind comments that you made about this class. Hopefully this class is making a difference in your life. I know it's making a difference in my life. I'm trying to be... Uh, all that these classes are telling us to be, the attitudes that Christ wants us to be like. Today, blessed are those who, are hung, who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And this fourth beatitude is really not as difficult to, uh, to understand the one last week about being meek. Maybe it might have been a little bit challenging for some of us, but this one's pretty simple and and straightforward. And as we look at the next step, we talked about the Beatitudes kind of build on each other. It's a step-by-step -step progression as we move, you know, move forward. <clears throat> we can see that first of all, that we need to recognize our spiritual destitution, that we need to mourn over our sin and over the sins of others. Let me make sure I get that back up a little bit. Tighten that so it doesn't fall down. There we go. And that we need to, uh, uh, you know, we mourn over our sin and the sins of others. And if we don't mourn over sin, pride might keep us from submitting ourselves to God and allowing him to lead. So when we allow him to lead, we will develop the hunger and the thirst for all that God's goodness and grace has to offer. And as we begin our thoughts this morning, let me see if I can't pull that up just a little bit more. There we go. Uh, can you think of a time that you were really, really hungry or really, really thirsty? You know, I've been thinking about this idea of hunger all week, and uh, it's been a challenge for me being over in San Antonio where they have some really good Mexican food restaurants over there. Uh, not to overeat, you know, this week. I'm thinking about this class today about hungering. And, uh, but, you know, can you think of a time that you were really, really hungry or really, really thirsty? Those of you that may have done a marathons or a triathlon or a, you know, Ironman, have anyone experienced that and know what it's like to be really, really thirsty? I wouldn't know what that's like because I've never been involved in one of those. But uh, I do remember back in high school, in football, we had what they called two-a-days. Anyone remember two-a-days? I don't remember, I don't know if they still even allow that today, you know, with the UIL and all the rules about that. But I remember one time, it, I was so hot and so thirsty that I just, you know, passed out. And that was my first experience of really, really being, you know, parched and, and, and thirsty. Or maybe you've been out walking or hiking and really were in need of some water to drink. Or maybe you've been sick or at the hospital and, you know, they wouldn't let you eat. You know, you were on that Jello diet. And, uh, you know, you were just really, really famished and hungry. Uh, you know, then you're finally able to eat. Oh, how good it is to finally be able to eat again or to drink what you want to. So we all have some kind of an idea what it means to be thirsty. And we've all probably had on occasion our stomachs have growled a little bit and you know we need our thirst quenched. But I really doubt that anyone really knows what it's like to be hungry and thirsty, maybe unless you've been a, a POW or some other drastic experience. When it comes to hunger, I do remember 
one, one uh, experience I had when I was in the Boy Scouts, I guess I was in junior high, and they had an honor camping award called Order of the Era. Anyone heard of OA or Order of the Era, where if you qualify, you get to wear this white sash, and it has a red arrow on it? Well, it was a, it was a, a weekend camping experience, and it was designed to really make you tough and see if you could survive. And so all weekend, it was doing, you know, menial, I mean, heavy work to do, no water, nothing to eat the whole weekend. And I, I wondered if I was going to be able to make it, but I guess that's the experience that I had of really, really being hunger. You know, maybe you've had some experience that you're thinking about. But, you know, we all feel hunger from time to time, and we want to eat. I imagine most of us probably eat, what, three times a day? Sometimes we eat more in those three times than we should. Sometimes we eat more than three times, a little snack along the way, something to help keep our hunger at bay. But, you know, God created us with the ability to experience hunger and thirst. God has given us wonderful mechanisms, such as a growling stomach. And then there's mechanisms, such mechanisms that maybe aren't built in. You know, such that sometimes maybe it's a clock that says, it's time to eat, you know, or it's noontime. It's time where the dinner bell rings. Now, I can't remember, that's a question, is it supper or is it dinner? Every time I say supper, and I'm going to oldest two grandkids, they say, no, Grandpa, it's dinner. Or if I say dinner, no, 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 it's supper. I can't remember if it's supper or dinner. I, I, I get confused. But God's mechanisms help make sure that we physically desire food. It's pretty amazing. And that feeling of hunger, it's a good thing. It reminds us to eat, in case we need to be reminded, right? <laughs> but our, our bodies need fuel. Or perhaps we begin to feel weak. Maybe we might feel lighthearted, lightheaded, if we don't eat. And we need some food, or sadly, without food, you know, we would starve. It's a sign of life. You know, as soon as a baby is born, the baby instinctively has the desire to eat. You know, babies don't have to be coerced or talked into eating. You know, they were born with the instinctive urge to eat in order to live. Now, the good thing about feeling hungry is it indicates a good appetite, a sign of a normal, healthy life. If you have a loss of appetite, maybe that's a red flag that something's off or something's just not right. How many ounces of water are we supposed to drink every day? You know, I've heard it's eight glasses, eight ounces in a glass. The eight by eight rule, have you heard of that? You know, I don't know, to satisfy our needs. For some people to drink eight glasses of water a day, that's, that's a real challenge and it's not an easy task. But you know, our body needs water or, if it, or it will die within days if it doesn't have water. Now perhaps <clears throat> there's a particular food or beverage that you have a special hungering for or a thirst for. Both our sons made many a trip back and forth to Abilene when they were in college. And it seems like that they could never drive through Hamilton, Texas <clears throat> without stopping at the local burger place that had the juiciest hamburgers on the planet, I'm told. Does anyone know what place I'm talking about in Hamilton, Texas? Storms. Someone's been there. I've been there too. It's a great place to eat. They tend to stop there every time they drove back and forth to Abilene. They could not go through Ab Hamilton without stopping at one of their favorite places to eat. <clears throat> you know, or maybe it's back in the hometown that you grew up in. A place they had the best chicken fried steaks or the best fish in the world that you could eat. Or maybe you're driving and you got this special feeling that, yeah, I got to have one of those you know, diet cherry coke limeades or whatever it is, your special drink that you're, you're thirsting for. You know, for some of us, maybe it's not just the drink, 
but it's the memories that are associated, you know, with go with food. You know, you hunger for that fried chicken, mashed potatoes, biscuits, gravy that maybe your grandmother would feed, feed you and the family. You know, for me as a kid growing up, Sunday afternoons after church, my grand my grandparents in West Columbia would take us out to eat, and then we'd go to my grandparents' house. And I look forward every Sunday afternoon to my grandmother getting out that carton of vanilla ice cream. Now, this was before they had mint chocolate chip and all the latest and greatest, you know, bluebell flavors. But that was one thing that I remembered, the memories of that vanilla ice cream. Now, you might say vanilla, that's just plain old vanilla. But as a kid, I didn't know any better. I loved it. And that was that special memory that, that, that went along with that. By the way, I mentioned ice cream for a reason. Anyone know what happens at 5 o'clock today? Ice cream! Someone read the bulletin. There's an ice cream opportunity today at 5 o'clock before our 6 o'clock singing, so don't miss out on that. You know, as I thought about this, I couldn't help but think about David. I don't know where you are in your daily Bible reading, but if you haven't gotten to 2 Samuel 23, you know, perhaps you'll be there soon, depending on what kind of daily Bible reading plan that you're on. Or if you're like uh, Emma Montandon, you know, our new minister's wife, I understand that she read the entire Old Testament in, was it 49 days that, that Sean told us last Sunday night? You know, so she's way past that, I suppose. But anyway, in 2 Samuel, verse, chapter 23, we read, David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David said, with longing, oh, that someone would give me a drink from the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So David is longing and thirsting for a particular water that he couldn't get to because the Philistines who were in Bethlehem. And he thirsted for this particular water from this particular well, a well close to where he had grown up, a well that he drank from, you know, when he was a boy. He could see it. He could taste it. You know, he thirsted for it. He desired for it. David was depleted, thirsty, and restless as he cried out for this water from this well. Well, as you read further in the next couple of verses that follow, as you know, Three of his mighty men risked their lives in order to get that water for him. But he refuses to drink it. But the point this morning is, he thirsted for that water from that well, that very special water. Have you ever had that kind of thirst for something or hunger for something like that? I'm sure you've heard the saying, you are what you eat, right? Well, that's not only true of the body, but also of the soul. The outer man depends on food and water, and the inner man depends on righteousness. The inner man of the spirit has an appetite that must be satisfied with spiritual food, God offers and provides. And if the inner man doesn't get nourished with this spiritual food, he becomes weak and sick. So in order for the inner man to function, he must be fed. You know, as we mentioned earlier about a baby instinctively wanting to eat to sustain life, so it's true that it's a sure sign of spiritual life when we hunger and thirst after righteousness. Normal, healthy souls desire spiritual food, just as normal, healthy bodies desire physical food. So, so what our focus on this morning is, of course, is our spiritual hunger and desire for spiritual food. Maybe a question that we can all ask ourselves do we desire spiritual food on a regular basis? Like as we do when we eat 
you know, physically. Or we do it just sporadically or on occasion or out of obligation. Last Sunday night, Sean Montenda's lesson mentioned about daily nourishment from God's Word. You know, sometimes we may not feel like reading God's Word, just like maybe you did not feel like getting up and coming to Bible class and worship this morning, but hopefully you'll be glad that you did. It's when we put our trust in Jesus that we find the answer to the hunger and thirst in our lives. We read in John chapter 6, verse 35, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. In John chapter 4, beginning at verse 13, well, you, you well remember the story of the woman at the well. And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. What happens if we don't eat or drink spiritually? We get weak. We get sick. We die. I'm reminded of the, the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. The prodigal son was dead. We read, For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they begin to be merry. Those who live in pleasure are dead spiritually. So let's talk a little bit more about hungering and thirsting and what that means. The picture that Jesus paints about someone that's hungering and thirsting, it's not a, not a very pretty picture. It's talking about someone who is ravenous with hunger. Someone that's parched and panting with thirst. It's the hunger of someone that's been out in the scorching heat and the blasting wind of the desert. And if no water is found soon, death is imminent. It's the hunger of a dying man. The thirst of a man on the verge of collapse. Anyone been there? You know, this thirst for nourishment, it's all-consuming. It's intense. So when we long for righteousness, as much as that person wants food and water, is when we can be found among the blessed, happy people of God. I remember a time in my lifetime, I had just graduated from high school, I guess I was 18 years old, and I had an opportunity to be a foreign exchange student in Costa Rica. And I'd never been away from home for longer than a week at, you know, Boy Scout camp or church camp, and I was going to be gone for the whole summer. And this was before the internet. So I wasn't able to find where the Lord's church was in Costa Rica. I understand now there's several congregations there, maybe many congregations in the country of Costa Rica. But I was not able to worship, you know, as I was accustomed to all growing up in the church and, and you know, going to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, and all of a sudden I was in a foreign country and wasn't able to have that weekly or, or bi-weekly, you know, nourishment from it, worshiping with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'll never forget the feeling that I had when I came back and was able to sit and worship, you know, with my home congregation and how blessed I felt to be back. You know, I'd forgotten how blessed that we have it. Sometimes you may have experienced something like that yourself where you've been away for a period of time and we're not able to worship. You know, I longed and I hungered and I thirsted just to be able to worship with brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, this world is frustrated and hungry. Everyone hungers and thirsts for fulfillment. But, you know, hunger's not the problem. And being thirsty's not the problem. 
In our country, there's, more, there's enough food and water to go around for most people. But the problem is looking for fulfillment in the wrong places with the wrong things. Ecclesiastes, as Kevin mentioned in his class the other night, is one example of a man searching to be fulfilled in every direction except for God's direction. And the conclusion, all is vanity. Life without God is meaningless. Life without God is futile. The psalmist expressed the idea of spiritual longing that, fits, that Jesus speaks about in this fourth beatitude in this way. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. I think we're going to sing that song tonight, by the way. There's two songs that have the same heading of as the deer Hopefully we're going to sing both of them tonight. In Isaiah chapter 26, Isaiah wrote, With my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me, I will seek you early. And David said it this way in Psalm 63, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. There is only one way to genuinely be happy in this world, and it's not seeking satisfaction among the sinful things of this world. When we recognize our spiritual hunger and thirst, and we allow righteousness to satisfy those things, we will truly be blessed and satisfied. You know, when we see the world around us, you know, whether it's on TV or when we're headed out, we don't see much evidence of hungering and thirsting for righteousness, do we? You know, things like wealth, popularity, prestige, along with many other things, you know, they seem to dominate the motives of many. I mean, there's a continual hunger and thirst for satisfaction in material things, or in adventure, or entertainment, or amusements that are never satisfying for long and often end in frustration and despair. And as the search continues for something else, something bigger, better, more exciting, more entertaining, because we are in this world, it's a challenge not to get caught up in this ourselves. But when this hunger is recognized and directed to God and His will, then satisfaction and true happiness is found. Jesus' advice in this attitude, as in the other attitude, Beatitudes, you know, it's opposite of the way that most people think. If you want happiness, stop looking for it. Kind of like, if you know someone that's looking for love, you know, they look, 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 but they don't seem to find it. But then they start thinking about others, and oftentimes love finds them. So don't seek happiness. Instead, we read in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So when we seek God, happiness will come. Now, while it doesn't seem logical, the only people genuinely happy, genuinely happy, are those who don't pursue happiness. Rather, they wake each day with a clean conscience, inner satisfaction, and genuine, deep down happiness in their soul. So how do people who aren't Christians make it in this world? Some would say they don't. They fake it. 
You know, they look for temporary sources to fill their hunger and to quench their thirst. You know, do you ever see somebody that maybe it's on Facebook or social media or just observing someone who seem or appear to just have it all? You know, they've got good looks, wealth, fame, popularity, you know, always smiling, carefree, seem to be happy, but you know, you know that they do not know Christ. So are they really happy inside? Do they know that something is missing inside? Are they hungering and thirsting for righteousness? I don't think so. But it's up to us to share with them how, how to be truly blessed and happy. So, what are, we, what are we to be hungering and thirsting after? Let's look at this word, righteousness. The word righteousness appears 92 times in 86 verses in the New Testament. It first appears in the Sermon on the Mount in this beatitude. And there's a striking difference in the righteousness that Jesus advocates as compared with the standards of righteousness that the scribes and the Pharisees, as he expresses it in this way in Matthew 5.20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees stressed righteous living, which to them meant following every Jewish law. Righteousness became self-righteousness. They wanted their outward lives to conform with the law as they understood it. But Jesus taught that conforming in that way led to poverty of life and spirit and not richness and abundance. Conformity of the heart was the important thing. When the inner thought conformed to his will, then the outer life would come automatically become right. So when we talk about righteousness, are we talking about here a, a good clean life? Are we talking about you know paying our bills on time, keeping our word, treating others the right way? While all these things are, are good and right and are connected with righteousness, the biblical use of the word righteousness goes beyond that. The Greek word righteousness, dik eosune, now you didn't think I could speak Greek, did you? And I don't do it very well, but dik eosune, according to Vine's expository dictionary, it has to do with whatever has been appointed by God to be acknowledged and obeyed by man or the character or quality of being right or just, conforming to the revealed will of God. I ran across an illustration that maybe will help us better understand what the Lord had in mind in this beatitude regarding hungering and thirsting after righteousness. So a woman comes into this room, and she is physically hungry and thirsty. And she sees a pitcher full of water. And she sees a fresh loaf of bread on the table. Now she could ask for a glass of water and a slice or two of bread. If she were totally famished, she might ask for all of it. So the difference is, in asking for a glass of water or the whole pitcher or a slice of bread as opposed to the whole loaf. Jesus in this beatitude, he's commanding us to hunger and thirst for the whole of righteousness, not just a part of it. He wants us to want everything not just a slice or two or a sip from the pitcher. He wants us to desire everything involved 
in true righteousness. Just as Jesus is the bread of life, we read in John 6, 48, and personally leads his followers to fountains of water of life, Revelation 7, 17, our desire can be for nothing less than satisfying our every spiritual need through him. Our hope of eternal life depends on our willingness to put aside our self-willed and arrogant ways and lay ourselves down at the mercy of God. First, we must submit to him by obeying the gospel in order to receive the righteousness that he gives to those he saves from sin by Jesus' blood. Then, in living new lives as God's people on earth, we must flee the corruption of the world and conform our daily lives to his pattern of living. This not only involves fundamental elements such as, you know, purity, honesty, integrity, but also the virtues of love and compassion. So what does this hungering and thirsting after righteousness involve? How do we do this? What all is involved with that? Well, first of all, it involves commitment. You know, the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, he wasn't hungry enough to give God, you know, top priority. And he went away blessed? No. He went away sorrowful. When we hunger and thirst for righteousness after righteousness, it will be evident and that our character that will be evidenced by our honesty and integrity, it will be evident in our speech that will be seasoned with grace and without crudeness or profanity. It will be evident in our dress that will reflect a modest heart. It will be evident in our involvement with God's people, you know, that will be consistent. Our private prayer life that will be enriched and meaningful, just to name a few. It involves also continuation. Blessed are those who keep on hungering. It's a continual life process of seeking his will. And it also involves contentment. Shall be filled. Jesus says, stop the search for contentment. If you seek God's will, then whatever life holds for you will be enough. It's the only thing that can truly satisfy. Psalm 34.10 But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Other things about righteousness that we need to consider. Righteousness, it's not of man. Isaiah 64, verse 6, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Philippians 3, verse 8, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. We must submit to the righteousness of God. Romans 10 verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, 
For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. This righteousness, this is the righteousness that comes by faith. Philippians 3, 9, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through the faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness from which is God by faith. This righteousness is in the gospel. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. We must seek this righteousness first in our lives. Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So hungering and thirsting after righteousness means to satisfy our daily desire that we ought to have as Christians to know God's word and to live God's word. The satisfaction of being filled. The Greek word, I'm not going to try to pronounce that one. That's beyond my pay grade, I think. But the Greek word for being filled is used to describe the gorging and fattening of animals with fodder you know, livestock feed. As it applies to us, it describes the filling to complete satisfaction. I'm reminded that my father-in-law, after we would finish a big meal, he'd kind of push himself back away from the table and he would say, I have a great sufficiency. And I always remember that. You know, he was completely satisfied and filled. Isaiah 55, verse 2. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. And filled with what? Filled with the very thing that we are hungering and thirsting for, righteousness. The more that we receive from Christ, the more we want from Christ, the more we want from Christ, the more we receive from Christ. And that's how it works. It never says, blessed are they who have hungered and thirsted. It said those who hunger and thirst. So it's an ongoing process of being filled. A couple of other points that we want to consider. The Bible has both what we need to eat what we need to eat and to drink. The Bible contains milk. 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And the Bible contains meat. Hebrews 5, 13, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to him that are of full age, even those by who by who reason of use had their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You know, just as our children, you know, it begins with milk, and then later it progresses, you know, to meat. You know, it's, it's always a joy when you see little babes born. Our, our two grandsons, now about 11 months old and six months old, it's amazing to see how much they've grown you know, in the last year, just from milk alone. And you might see our grandson, Bo, crawling around on the floor in the foyer, you know, after church on a Sunday night or Wednesday night, from one end of the foyer, you know, to the other. And if you've seen him, you know he hadn't missed very many meals. He's a chunky little boy, but he's headed straight toward the gym where the big guys are playing. But, you know, it's a joy to watch them as they begin later sitting in their high chair and eating, starting out with soft foods, and then later, you know, they're picking up the foods themselves as they continue to grow. 
We need both milk and meat as we grow spiritually strong and healthy. And don't we like those all-you-can-eat buffets, right? Or I understand Red Lobster has an endless shrimp, you know, promotion from time to time. But, you know, God has given us exactly that. He's given us an all-you-can-eat buffet of righteousness in his word. And it's not intended for dessert only. But it's a full course, a balanced spiritual meal. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. So we are encouraged to examine and try ourselves. The message is a paraphrased version. It says it in this way. They lump the verses together. Test yourselves to make sure that you are solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourselves regular checkups. You need firsthand evidence, not mere, say, not mere hearsay, that Jesus Christ is in you. Test it out. If you fail the test, do something about it. I hope the test won't show that we have failed, but if it comes to that, rather the test showed our failure than yours. We're rooting for the truth to win out in you. We couldn't possibly do otherwise. Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We need to do this on a daily basis. Skip over a couple here. <clears throat> In James chapter 1, we are told to be doers of the word and not hearers. For anyone who is a hearer of the word and not a doer is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. So we can be spiritually healthy, or we can be spiritually unhealthy, or spiritually dead. So in conclusion, our world, our country, our community, our neighborhoods, everywhere around us, we can see spiritual starvation. And it's sad because so many are starving, they don't even realize it. So hopefully this morning we see the need for this great beatitude. You know, our desire is to be spiritually hungry and thirsty. The object of our desire, righteousness. The way that we can satisfy that desire to be spiritually filled by God as we seek him wholeheartedly and learn and apply his will in our lives. And sharing it with the hungry and thirsty, starving world about us. In closing, let's read William Barclay's you know, comments about this fourth beatitude. Oh, the bliss of the man who longs for total righteousness as a starving man longs for food and a man perishing of thirst longs for water. For that man will be truly satisfied. Next week, we're going to be talking about blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. I appreciate your kind attendance. And I'm starting to see people gather to grab a donut. Thank you for your attention.